I also wanted to give a little space between um, Professor Schmitter's talk and mine, because when I use the term dialectics, we're going to be going over again some of the same territory, but maybe in a little bit different way. Um, when I talk about dialectical thinking, I'm referring to the concept that, that Philippe already mentioned, that two opposing ideas can both exist at the same time, and they can both be true. Um, the universe is filled with opposing sides and opposing forces. Um, in a Hegelian sense, everything is composed of contradictions. And there is a movement from idea or thesis to antithesis to thin synthesis. And that enables us to become closer to the truth in our search for the truth. Um, because I started out as a Scandinavianist, I have to bring up Kierkegaard. So um, in Kierkegaardian dialectics, there is the manifestation of man's separation and alienation from himself or herself and society, and also the expression of the human struggle towards integration and liberation. In fact, this is one peculiar peculiarity of Kierkegaard that I thought was important in today's discussion. Um, he was extremely sensitive to the fluidity of meanings of most terms in everyday speech. And he rejected the tendency of academics to artificially fix meanings. So I believe that dialectics comprise a critical essence of Elmer Honkish's thinking. Um, for as all of us who were his students and were present at his very colorful presentations, they were most often constructed in a dialectical fashion. He posed one characteristic of identity formation or of the history of civilization, and then he, proved, he provided a counterexample. And it was always up to us, his students, his audience, to think about and construct some kind of synthesis from his presentations of a wide variety of topics. Physics, cosmology, philosophy, theology, cult cultural anthropology, psychology, history of ideas, the arts, and that's just the beginning of the list of what he showed us. Um, in the book, The Toothpaste of Immortality, and I have a little anecdote that goes with that, um, Elamir would call me up at the strangest times of day or night or when I was in the strangest places to ask me about a better translation for a word. And I remember exactly this title. I was at a massage. And the phone rings, and I saw it was Elamir, and I said, well, you have to excuse me. I really think I must answer this. And, because we also shared some physical problems together that we would discuss sometimes. And, um, and he goes, Jody, you know, what do you think of that title, The Toothpaste of Immortality? And I go, I'm, I'm not really convinced, Elamir. You know, I, I'm not quite sure where you're going with this. And he goes, well, can you give me some alternatives? I go, can you tell me what you mean? I don't, didn't really understand what the concepts of the toothpaste of immortality meant. Um, but he was right. Um, it is a good title. And it, uh, you know, it makes you curious. So you go in and you try to find out what it is. Anyway. Um, to get back to my text. In The Toothpaste of Immortality, he argues the middle road between those like Max Weber, who believe that we have a strong inner core, and those who say that we have many selves, or no selves, only roles. In his own synthesis, Elmer says we have a kind of inner core from which we gain direction in our lives, and we also have a lot of roles and many selves. And there is a dynamic between that core self and the peripheral self of everyday relations. My next slide. I enjoyed so much finding these graphics because that's one of the things Elamer was fantastic at, was finding some pictures to go with his text. And so I had a lot of fun 
thinking the way I remembered he may be thinking to find the most kind of dramatic images for you. Um, Elamir describes the dialectic world that we live in um, as a so-called information age where only facts, numbers, digital codes are important as rational messages and as a society of experience. A re-enchanted society where myths, emotions, and mythologies are important. And he thinks that we are re-enchanting ourselves now more than ever before. In Fears and Symbols, he writes about two strategies humankind uses to conquer existential fears. And the first is the Promethean strategy that was mentioned by Professor Schmitter. That goes back to the Prometheus myth that was already mentioned this morning, the mythical hero who brought fire to humankind and then was severely punished for that action. Um, he, uh, Elamir saw Prometheus as a metaphor for meeting our material, external um, needs for survival, fire, warmth, security, food, and shelter. And so the Promethean strategy refers to everything people do to feel externally and materially secure in a universe in which many things, like natural catastrophes, are unpredictable and can threaten human existence. So we build houses, we invent technology that is supposed to make our lives easier and smoother. But this isn't enough, if you're a human being, just to have your physical needs alleviated. Um, people have spiritual needs, spiritual fears of death, for example, which also need to be taken care of. And this is where the Apollonian strategy comes in. We have questions about why am I here? What is the meaning of life? So the Apollonian strategy attempts to conquer the fear of death that destroys human efforts and makes them seem in vain. In order to overcome this fear, people began to tell stories that lifted their own existence up into a higher plane and gave life meaning. These stories became grand narratives that are not questioned for their original human construction. And I'm talking about the grand narratives of Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism. So why does Elmer counterpose these concepts? What he emphasizes is that we must try to understand the whole of reality, not just parts of it, of ourselves and our existence. It's this concentration on wholeness that I find in his work that influences my work on axial ages, which I first heard from Elamer, Carly Hesperson, I just could never get him out of my mind, about 20 years ago. Um, and my work on paradigm shift from a mechanistic worldview to an organic worldview. It also influenced um, my work on the dialectics of scientific inquiry in an age of uncertainty, which is a term or a phrase that Elamir used more and more often. So let's look at Elamir's assistant as assessment of quantum mechanics of everyday life, which is available here. In that, uh, um, in that article, he wrote that significant roles that would fill people's lives with purpose and meaning are missing today, and the knowledge gained from the quantum universe is not at all promising. And it makes it even more difficult for people to find their place, roles, and identities in a world that has become increasingly incomprehensible. The loss of traditional fixed points of orientation and growing uncertainty in an infinite an incomprehensible universe drains intellectual and emotional energies and breaks the continuity and coherence of human communities. He warns that people who feel that their lives are pointless and meaningless are less able to respond to the challenges of the 21st century. This is what Josef was talking about in the opioid crisis in the United States. Well, we have the problem here too. Exploring the possibilities of how a new civilization might emerge and generate 
um, new meaning and significance for people, he predicts, LMR predicts, may become one of the primary tasks of the social, human, and natural sciences if they're able and willing to work together and cooperate. Some scientists have made serious efforts to establish links between the quantum universe and humankind, and in some cases, even the meaning of human life. Alamant writes, their attempts have been the first important steps to decode the hidden message a quantum universe may have for humankind. Still, the quantum universe is far from becoming a protective framework within which human beings can feel at home in the world, enjoying relative safety, giving meaning to their lives. This is a major social and human problem because when you lose your purpose and meaning, you lose life motivation and whole societies might lose their momentum. There are many economic, social, and cultural causes behind the decreasing ability of Western civilization to create a cosmic home for its citizens. The advance of quantum mechanics is only one of them, but nevertheless, it would be a grave mistake not to pay increasing attention to its potential role in this field. The problem is that scholars outside the natural sciences do not really understand what quantum mechanics tells them about the secrets of the universe. The only way to solve this dilemma would be to be a close and systematic cooperation between natural and physical scientists, cosmologists, philosophers, theologians, cultural anthropologists, psychologists, social scientists, artists. This is Elmer talking again, you can tell. He loved lists. Um, the final, his final word on this is, closing a smoldering science war, a genuine dialogue should be started in which participants try to understand one another's language and way of thinking. Um, two more slides and I'm done. I argue that with the move of natural sciences towards social sciences via complexity studies and the move of humanities towards the social sciences via cultural studies, we are in the process of overcoming the two cultures of knowledge by recognizing that reality is constructed. And if you are students of Wallerstein, you will know that this is not my original idea. This gradual process of overcoming the artificial distinction between hard and separate disciplines and moving towards the unification of science and human endeavor provides the basis not only for holistic scientific inquiry, but for the basis of new regenerative educational models and multiversities as opposed to universities. Instead of science being the enemy of humanities, they both share a common enemy, which is an educational system that avoids addressing the complex and varied global challenges of our age. Real and exacting critical training in any field is essential in order to prepare young people today for the unexpected uncertainties and surprises they will face. And now I will simply give you Elamer's last word I need to explain this graphic. I searched for an hour for this. If any of you saw his interview at the Woodrow Wilson Institute or any of you took part in, in his presentations here, this was one of his favorite um, graphics. The woman with the upraised arms. What is that symbolize? What does that mean, that graphic? What does it say to you? The woman is separating light from the darkness, okay? And for this, this meant a lot to, to Elamir. I, it means a lot to me that it's a woman doing it. Um, and, and uh, you know, that is what he tried to do with his intellectual creativity, was to try to provide light where there was darkness. And so I will give you um, him, his last, his words as the end of my, my um, contribution. Only such common efforts have any chance of interpreting the quantum cosmos also as a symbolic framework within which human beings can find relative safety and feel their lives have significance and meaning. Okay.
Thank you. <laughs>